Hey everybody, Sean Rosensteel here. Welcome back to Chapter 7, Organized Planning. Now, I know for some people this is their least favorite chapter, but good news is there's still a lot of great key points and big takeaways that we can walk away with, right? So it's one of the longer chapters. I think it's about 30 pages or so. Uh, a few tangents along the way, a little bit of information that maybe no longer is relevant to us. But let's go through it and talk about some of the key points, right? So first key point here is checked and approved. Now this is a big one. I'm on page 91. Napoleon says that no individual has sufficient experience, education, native ability, and knowledge to ensure the accumulation of a great fortune without the cooperation of other people. Every plan you adopt in your endeavor to accumulate wealth should be the joint creation of yourself and every other member of your mastermind group. You may originate your own plans, either in whole or in part, but see that those plans are checked and approved by the members of your mastermind alliance. And of course, there's an entire chapter on the principle of the mastermind. But this is so important. Two things here. Number one, whatever your desire is, do you have a plan in writing? Hopefully, if you applied the exercise in chapter two on desire, you now have a plan or else at least the beginning of a plan, right, in writing. But there's a second part to this. And he says that that plan must be checked and approved. I started doing this about three years ago uh, with a few friends. I have accountability meetings every two weeks with a few friends, as well as I'm a part of multiple masterminds now as well. But that is just such a huge, huge step in the right direction when you actually share those plans with people who you like, know, and trust, right? At the beginning of this, uh, this year, I shared uh, my plan for my major goal for this year with one of the people in my mastermind group and he came back and said, hey, Sean, you know, this, this step number eight, you know, all the way at the end, something that you're not going to do till Q4 of this year, I think that belongs in Q1. I think that's one of the first things you should do. And I had a blind spot. He was absolutely right. And it literally took 20 seconds for his fresh set of eyes and his fresh brain to see the mistake that I had made. But I was so far into the weeds of drafting my own plan, I had a blind spot. So make sure that whatever plans you're crafting, that you get them checked and approved by like-minded people who share the same common objectives that you have. Second key point here is persistence, again, on page 91. If the first plan which you adopt does not work successfully, replace it with a new plan. If this plan fails to work, replace it, in turn, with still another and so on until you find a plan which does work. Right here is the point at which the majority of men meet with failure because of their lack of persistence in creating new plans to take the place of those which fail. So again, this is another you know, chapter we're talking about here, this idea of persistence, right? But it's so huge. Just because you've drafted a plan doesn't mean that that plan is going to work. You know, I, every morning I, I, I plan my day. And, you know, by 8 a.m., uh, my plan is, my plan goes up in smoke, <laughs> right? It's really hard to control or to plan what goes on, you know, in the next hour. So it's so important to remain flexible with your plan, to anticipate, anticipate challenges, be flexible up front, but also be persistent with those plans, right? So be persistent in reworking those plans until you get your desired outcome. Third key point here is practical and workable plans. He goes on to say that the most intelligent man living cannot succeed in accumulating money nor in any other undertaking without plans which are practical and workable. So as you look at your plans, are they practical? Are they workable? Those plans need to be practical and workable so that you can continue with persistence crafting them over and over and over, tweaking them, adjusting them, reworking them, course correcting along your journey to get whatever it is you want. 
So important. Fourth key point here, temporary defeat. Thomas Edison failed 10,000 times before he perfected the incandescent electric light bulb. That is, he met with temporary defeat 10,000 times before his efforts were crowned with success. Temporary defeat should mean only one thing, the certain knowledge that there is something wrong with your plan. So isn't that an interesting reframe? If you meet with defeat, you're not a failure. You haven't failed. It just means you have to go back and rework those plans, right? What an awesome way to reframe failure here in a certain sense, isn't it? So I love that story about Thomas Edison. We've all heard that before. 10,000 times sounds a little bit um, extravagant. <laughs> you know, that must have been a pretty burning desire of Mr. Edison's to fail 10,000 times at something. Uh, I don't think there's another story of that in human history that exists. But um, just keep that in mind. Keep the story of 10, 000, uh, Thomas Edison, his failing 10,000 times. And just remember this idea of temporary defeat and how all that really all that really suggests is that your plans are flawed. That's it. It doesn't have to mean anything else. So that should trigger you and send you down a path of reworking your plans. Fifth key point here, cause and effect. Now I'm all the way on page 106. We're going to skip past a lot of content here. Napoleon says, we are what we are and what we are because of our own conduct. If there is a principle of cause and effect which controls business, finance, and transportation, this same principle controls individuals and determines their economic status. So this principle of cause and effect is, is, is so powerful. Uh, it reminds me of James Allen uh, in his great book, As a Man Thinketh, right? We are what we are and what we are because of our own conduct. So every thought we have, every choice we make, every, uh, every action we take produces its own like-kind effect, right? So very important when we're thinking about planning and the steps that we take. If we don't plan, if we don't even begin to create a practical and workable plan, well, there's a, that's a cause and there's an effect to that, right? If we move forward with our plan and meet temporary defeat on step three, let's say, and we don't rework the plan or we're just defeated and we accept that defeat, that's a cause and there's a certain effect to that. Right? On the flip side, if we remember that temporary defeat just means we have to go back and rework our plans and we continue forging ahead, well, that's a cause with a very specific effect too, isn't it? Sixth key point here, weaknesses and strengths. I'm on page 113 now. Napoleon says that you should know all of your weaknesses in order that you may either bridge them or eliminate them entirely. You should know your strength in order that you may call attention to it when selling your services. You can know yourself only through accurate analysis. And if you're familiar with this, and by the way, if you're just tuning in, I'm using the uh, Think and Grow Rich version from Tribeca Books. There's a link to download this, uh, I'm sorry, to purchase this exact um, version on Amazon. No matter what version you have, it may be on the following page, it may be on the same page one, uh, as I just read from, but there are 28 questions you should answer. It's a way for you to take inventory. So I'm going to check you a little bit here as far as you actually applying the principles in this book. Have you just simply read over this or have you actually taken the time to answer and self-evaluate through these 28 questions? It says self-analysis questionnaire for personal inventory. And I think what you'll find is if you go through this and you actually put in a few minutes or 15 minutes maybe, you'll walk away from that exercise with some interesting aha moments and with some interesting findings as it relates to your own unique strengths and weaknesses. Okay. Seventh key point here is useful service. I absolutely love this one. 
I'm on page 114 now. He says that your value is established entirely by your ability to render useful service or your capacity to induce others to render useful service. Then I'm going to jump over to page 128, I'm sorry, 123 here. Napoleon continues by saying, There is but one dependable method of accumulating and legally holding riches, and that is by rendering useful service. No system has ever been created by which men can legally acquire riches through mere force of numbers or without giving in return an equivalent value of one form or another. So this idea of useful service, you know, I, I found a lot of purpose in my life by adding value to others and, and, and by serving others. So what's fascinating about this concept of useful service is not only can it help you live a more purposeful and, and meaningful life, not only can it create more fulfillment to you, but it may actually help you accelerate the accumulation of your own financial wealth as well. So there's two sides to that coin, right? So interesting thought. Last point here in this chapter on organized planning is law of economics. And the last point really bleeds well into this point. I'm at the bottom of page 123 here. Napoleon suggests that there is a principle known as the law of economics. This is more than a theory. It is a law no man can beat. Mark well the name of this principle and remember it because it is far more powerful than all the politicians and political machines. I'm going to jump over to page 125 here. He says that the system denies no one this right, but it does not and cannot promise something for nothing. Because the system itself is irrevocably controlled by the law of economics, which neither recognizes nor tolerates for long, getting without giving. The law of economics was passed by nature. There is no Supreme Court to which violators of this law may appeal. The law hands out both penalties for its violation and appropriate rewards for its observance without interference or the possibility of interference by any human being. The law cannot be repealed. It is as fixed as the stars in the heavens and subject to and a part of the same system that controls the stars. Boy, I love this key point here, the law of economics. This all reminds me of an incredible book by, uh, I believe it was Bob Berg and Nan Silver. If you're into business, it's called The Go-Giver. And it's one of my favorite business books. It's a simple business parable or fable, I should say. And uh, it really, to me, helps me through story understand this law of economics. So be sure to check that out if you haven't read it already. So that's it. That does it for what I believe are the key points of Chapter 7, Organized Planning. If you liked what you learned here today, be sure to like and share this video with others who might benefit from it. And also subscribe, will ya? That way you will get notified when I release future videos in this series. In the next video, we're going to be talking about Chapter 8, Decision. Really cool chapter. I know in my life I've struggled a lot with being indecisive. And uh, this is one of those chapters that really helped me to not only become more decisive in my life, but it also helped me to stop changing some of the decisions I've made shortly after I've made them. So I look forward to seeing you and serving you there. Take care.